rest of the uh, GNC. And before I introduce our speaker, I just thought I'd give those of you who aren't so familiar with the conference uh, a little bit of a history of what we've been doing here. So the conference was founded with the aim of encouraging the practical and theoretical study of both negotiation skills and also conflict resolution. And this really stems from a belief in the importance of some key principles. So empathy, understanding and respect in how we deal with others, uh, not only at the interpersonal level, but also between groups um, and between states. Uh, this is the seventh year that the conference has taken place. Uh, and during that time, we've welcomed students from across the world, many of whom have gone on to positions in government, in private business, in international organizations, and hopefully they've been taking the lessons they've learned from this conference with them. Uh, many of our participants has, has, um, have also remained part of the GNC, including um, a good friend of mine, Tobias Langenegger, who attended the first conference as a student before returning as a speaker and subsequently becoming co-president. Uh, now, tragically, Toby passed away last year, though the attendees of this and subsequent conferences will continue to benefit from the contribution he made. Um, it was his initiative to include these public keynote speeches, uh, speeches, which have proved a way for the conference to branch out beyond simply our attendees here in Zurich. And we, we'd like to dedicate this speech to him. Um, now, there's no need for me to remind you of the importance of addressing conflict, both within and between societies. Uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, the role of cooperation uh, between individuals, communities, and governments comes into even a sharper focus. So we're therefore honored today to be joined by Bertie Ahern, who has enjoyed a distinguished, and I hope you won't mind me saying a long career um, in Irish politics. Uh, Mr. Ahern served in the Irish parliament for 34 years, 20 years as a member of cabinet, um, as a minister of finance twice, as minister of labor, and as a government whip. He was also elected three times as the Taoiseach, uh, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland. Now, on the international stage, Mr. Ahern was also the President of the European Council from January to, uh, to June 2004, where he presided over the historic enlargement of the European Union to 27 member states, um, including eight countries from Eastern Europe. His, he also shaped Ireland's leadership during his time as Taoiseach um, on key global issues, such as increasing aid to developing countries and tackling the spread of HIV AIDS. Now, the defining moment of his tenure and what I think will uh, form the basis of his speech today um, and also a defining moment in Irish history was Mr. Ahern's successful negotiation with Tony Blair of, of the Good Friday Agreement between the British and Irish governments and the political parties in Northern Ireland. Now, for students of conflict studies or peace studies, this agreement is one of the, the cases um, cited to be studied and scrutinized. Uh, so I'm therefore pleased to hand the stage uh, or the, the focus of the webcam to Bertie Ahern, who will reflect on his experiences um, and, and, and enlighten us into the, the, the process um, of, of negotiating peace. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you, Jack. Delighted to be with you as, as, as president uh, of Global Negotiating Conference. And I congratulate you on all the work that you have done into your seventh year of um, uh, moving this conference on and uh, join uh, with you in uh, recalling uh, your your co-president, uh, Toby, who, who passed away uh, over the year. Um, sorry, I'm not with you in person, um, uh, Jack, but that, that, that just wasn't possible because of COVID-19, like so many uh, other, uh, other events, uh, so many things have been cancelled, but um, thankfully, uh, technology has uh, allowed us to, uh, to, to, to uh, speak together. Um, to all your attendees, uh, to your participants, uh, to your colleagues there in the, uh, in the university, and to all the others uh, joining on, um, and I send my best wishes from uh, from from Dublin and to uh, say how it, an honour it is to be uh, with you. I hopefully get to the University of Zurich another day, uh, and 
uh, see all your your good colleagues and uh, your your work in in action. Uh, I I'd be just say very briefly before I turn to what the main um, uh, content of my my address is to you. Uh, and I'm glad we have a, a good bit of time and we get, take questions at the end. And I'm happy to take questions on on not just the Good Friday Agreement and uh, Northern Ireland issues, the Island of Ireland issues, but uh, any of the other issues. I have been involved now for uh, probably four decades in in issues of conflict. When I was chief whip, um, uh, I was negotiating between political parties and um, differences in my own party at the time, uh, trying to uh, bring things to, uh, together and to move things together. Uh, during that time, uh, we had uh, three general elections in Ireland, so it was it was a, a, a busy period in a very short uh, space of time. I went on to be Minister for Labour uh, uh, on two occasions, and I, I spent many years negotiating uh, the difficulties between employers and trade unions and moving the legislation in Ireland to modernise legislation from very old legislation to modern legislation. And we set up a system like the Nordic countries, a social partnership where uh, the government, employers, trade unions, farmers, big and small business, um, all work together to do three year rolling programmes. I think I negotiated about six of those during my, uh, my career. And then in Europe, uh, when I was Labour Minister, I was president of Social Affairs Council way back 30 years ago, this time 30 years ago in 1990, when we dealt with the Social Charter, the Charter of Fundamental um, Rights, uh, which still stands to today as legislation uh, in, in most countries. Um, and then, as you uh, said, uh, during the uh, Irish presidency, uh, we, I was involved in the enlargement discussions for a number of years. Uh, and also the negotiation of the European Constitution, which we successfully negotiated, but for, unfortunately the member countries didn't uh, ratify it um, after France and the Netherlands uh, rejected it at that time. But it still stood as a really fine document, not because I was negotiating it, but because I think of the output of, of all of the colleagues uh, uh, in the in the work at the time. Uh, I was also the Irish negotiators for the Maastricht Treaty, um, um, which was set up the Euro and all of the other things, but they're all long ways back, um, all back in, um, in, in history, but I'd be glad. More recent years, I've been involved in conflict resolution. Uh, as we were saying, all fair to you, Jack, um, uh, I've been involved with a number of organizations. I was with the World Economic Forum for four years, dealing with their Agenda Council on Conflict uh, Resolution. Um, and I've worked with um, a, a number of, of, of universities on different projects. Um, I spend a lot of my time in Northern Ireland now as I'm honorary uh, professor in, the, in peace studies at the George, Senator George Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. Uh, that's George Mitchell, the famous senator, senator who also dealt with the Middle East, but he helped us greatly. And um, for the last decade, I've been adjunct um, professor of mediation and conflict intervention at our, one of our own universities, the National Universities of Minute, uh, which is just south of Dublin. Um, and for six or seven years now, I've been senior advisor to the International Advisory Council to the Harvard uh, International Negotiation Programme. Um, my latest uh, and just recent project has been uh, as chairman of the Bougainville Referendum Commission in Papua New Guinea, which was to bring an end to the conflict and try to uh, move uh, the peace process there. 23,000 people lost their lives in a relatively small area uh, in Bougainville. Um, and thankfully, uh, at Christmas time, we concluded the negotiations and next month, uh, the elections will take uh, place there and um, but thankfully things have been very peaceful. Uh, prior to that uh, with President Atasari which many of your people would know the Nobel Peace Prize winner um, uh, I have worked with um, his conflict management initiative in Ukraine uh, and I've worked with the, 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 the diplomatic political initiative in, in Turkey um, which we're still working with the, the Kurdish conflict. We haven't made much headway uh, on either of those, <laughs> so um, work work outstanding and on, on, on it goes, maybe someday, but at least we've 
So I've been involved in many, many of these. But I want to speak to you today uh, about my own country, about the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, uh, I'm calling my paper Peace Through Inclusive Dialogue. Um, um, and obviously, I'm immensely privileged to be uh, your invited guest today. And thank you for that, Jack. I'm a proud Irishman. I'm always ha happy to share uh, Irish uh, history. Uh, we have a long history. Uh, thousands of years, hundreds of years of conflict. Um, I'm not going to do all of that today. <laughs> We've had eight, 800 years of conflict with our near neighbour, but I'm not responsible for all of that. So I just cover the bits I am. Um, but I want to share my experience with your, uh, your attendees and particularly younger people of peace through inclusive dialogue. And I think that from what I've read of uh, the excellent work you've been doing over the years and, and your your conference is to explain in some detail how our history in Ireland brought us uh, to where we are now. Um, uh, people often ask what is our proudest achievement was as, as Taoiseach, as Prime Minister. I always reply simply that it's uh, an easy one to answer, to have the opportunity uh, to make a contribution to the creation of what we all pray will be a lasting peace in my, my own island, in my own country. And that has been the greatest privilege uh, of, of my life. Um, I think we all think of our, our own homeland. We think there's no place uh, like it on earth. And in my place, in case I'm very happy simply to be right about that, uh, Ireland is a place which has been blessed uh, by uh, natural beauty, an island of wonderful contrasts in terms of mountains, of valleys and uh, sea and beautiful cities and, and towns uh, led by my own city of Dublin. So as you appreciate, I'm very biased there, uh, Jack. But uh, the home of Trinity College and uh, so many other places that I'm sure you, you all know. And transcending all of that, we, we are a, a people uh, that have been given the world uh, over the centuries, such a luminary as James Joyce, as uh, George Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, Oscar Wilde, uh, and that's just some of our, our writers. And uh, there's a, a wonderful publication by an Irish-American writer, Thomas Cahill, Cattle, as we call them, but uh, called How the Irish Save Civilization. Uh, and the title of which alone tells you all you need to know in terms of the general point I'm trying to make. Uh, but seriously, uh, it is a, a fine work that I would uh, commend to you all. And yet, despite all of these amazing features in terms of land, uh, uh, of, of people, of history of a beautiful Ireland, it has uh, one being down through the centuries, one of war, of bloodshed, of conflict, division, of hatred, of famine and emigration. That unfortunately has been the majority of our history. And if that uh, was our history, much of the reason for it had to be with our geography. Uh, we're a small island, highly strategically located between a much larger island on the edge of the great continent of Europe and pointing out across uh, the mighty Atlantic to the new world, the United States of America. Um, now, you can all relax then um, because I'm not going to recount 800 years of Irish history, uh, but suffice it is to say that the interaction uh, between our neighboring island of Britain and ourselves with uh, occasional incursions from continental brethren, uh, such as the Vikings and the Norse, um, has led us to a canvas that has been uh, a complex and multi-layered and sadly uh, for too often stained by bloodshed uh, and by conflict. I'm going to do a, a rapid forward, uh, if I can, President, to, to the 1920s and the division of the island in two, uh, with the south, my state, uh, gaining its independence, while the northeast of the island, today's Northern Ireland, uh, renamed as it still does part of the United Kingdom. And this a new configuration did not resolve the legacy of history. Effectively, the two parts of the island evolved in different directions. The south beset at the outset by a bitter civil war set about the task of building itself into a, into a viable independent state. It took several decades uh, for that process to be complete. And in the meantime, uh, and in parallel, the north experienced a very different a trajectory, a tensions between the uh, majority community, largely Protestant and supportive of the Union, 
with Britain, the minority community, community largely Catholic and supportive of United Ireland, uh, remained uh, high uh, throughout uh, the decades. And the political reality was that the power and influence, influence largely rested with the uh, unionist community, um, with the Catholics nationalist community, uh, having a strong sense of being discriminated against in its own land, while also feeling cut off from the, the new state and the South. Uh, over those decades between 1920 and the late 60s, uh, the two jurisdictions on the island had very little to do with each other, sadly. And despite being close neighbours on a small island, uh, there was little cooperation between the two administrations. On the contrary, relations between Dublin and Belfast were tense, they were hostile. Uh, and if this was bad, matters were to become distinctly worse in the late 60s, where I now moved to. Uh, the old enemies of um, history, which had remained bottled up and packed down in the decades since partition in the early 20s, uh, suddenly exploded to the surface again. Northern Ireland was the cockpit, but the ripples affected the whole island because we are a small island. The catalyst for that um, was, which many of the attendees will be familiar with around the world, was the arrival of civil rights movements around the world and civil rights movement in the north of Ireland too. And echoing what was happening in parts of Europe and happening in the United States with Martin Luther King and happened in France in a big way. People took to the streets of the North demanding civil rights for Catholics and the end uh, to discrimination. Uh, the authorities in the, the North reacted in a, a strong fashion, applying riot police seeking to prevent the marches by force. Uh, Intercommunion tensions uh, between Catholics and Protestants escalated rapidly and alarmingly. And for the purposes of my remarks, uh, to your conference today, I'm going to telescope uh, dramatically. Uh, but suffice it is to say, by 1970, uh, 50 years ago, a large scale conflict was underway in Northern Ireland, subsequently to be known euphemistically as the Troubles, and which was to last a whole long and bitter uh, generation. Um, thousands of people lost their lives in relative as well as in absolute terms, uh, an enormous uh, number. Thousands were uh, injured and named. And the theater of conflict was populated by paramilitary organizations, the Irish Republican Army, uh, the IRA, as is known around the world, the INLA, uh, the Ulster Defense Association, uh, the Ulster Volunteers Force on the uh, Protestant side. On the state side, the British Army was deployed on the streets of the North for the first time in many decades, uh, serving beside local law enforcement organizations, such as the Royal Ulster Constabulary and the Ulster Defence Regiment, who were part-time but paid uh, by the administration. And while many Catholics and nationalists condemned the campaign of violence of the IRA, there were deep tensions between the security forces and the broader Catholic nationalist community. Protestant paramilitary groups, such as the, uh, the UDA and the UVF, carried out horrendous sectarian attacks on Catholic victims uh, often chosen at random. And for their part, many unionists were besieged by an organization, the IRA, which they regarded as ruthless terrorists who had in their view, the tacit support at least of the uh, Catholic community. And while much of the activity of the conflict took place in the North, the South was also greatly affected with some horrific incidents, the loss of life which took place many times. And this is to make no mention of the disruption to commercial and economic uh, life as well. So all in all, for 25 plus years or so, between the late 60s, the uh, end of the 90s, were a nightmare of awful proportions for Ireland. And it had us in the, in the global headlines almost every week for all of the wrong uh, reasons. At the same time, it would be wrong to say there was no progress. The British and Irish government started to work more closely together in the mid 1980s. Uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985 uh, formally gave the Irish government a consultative role. And with the Republican movement, there was the beginning of a reassessment of its objectives, uh, which a careful encouragement from the two governments 
to the IRA ceasefire uh, in the mid 90s, but it proved impossible to get uh, truly meaningful negotiations uh, underway. The ceasefire broke down again in 1996 and atrocities started again. People will, um, of a certain age at least, will remember the huge bombings of Canary Wharf in London, which closed the financial area, the bombing of the centre of Belfast or of, um, of Manchester which affected the whole shopping area of Manchester. However, thanks to tireless work by successive governments and officials on both sides and political leaders, um, notably John Hume, who's uh, again a Nobel Peace Prize winner with David Trimble, some of the core principles of which were to underline the eventual settlement had been hammered out. Uh, and that was the situation which essentially obtained President when I became Taoiseach um, our Prime Minister in the summer of 1997. Uh, coincidentally, uh, it turned out very importantly, Tony Blair became a Prime Minister of Britain at the same, just, just about a week or two in front of me. Uh, we met early on. We had been working in opposition together. Uh, we hit it off well, I think, uh, to say, and in terms of negotiation, we both agreed that addressing uh, the Northern Ireland situation was a top priority for both of us. We were both conscious uh, how difficult the task was going to be after decades of conflict, if not hundreds of years. Uh, and despite the genuine and best efforts of our predecessors, uh, the situation had not proved amenable uh, to resolution up to that uh, stage. Uh, by the way, uh, as I always do, I'd like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to Tony Blair and uh, the immense contribution he made to peace process in, in Ireland. Um, I'm very sure the history will record that contribution in a very positive way, and he truly deserves it. Uh, one of the great bonuses of my job as Taoiseach was getting to know uh, Tony Blair and working with him, and we became very uh, dear and trusted uh, friends, and he was probably uh, the first Prime Minister that took Ireland seriously. Uh, and that gave a huge amount of his time and effort at, uh, to assisting in finding resolution. Again, uh, Jack telescoping here, uh, but over the uh, 12 months, our first 12 months in office, but after spending a number of years in, as leaders of the opposition, as both of us were, um, uh, following our first meeting in the summer of 97, we engaged in a deeply intensive process of talks around the conflict. Uh, this also involved the main political parties in Northern Ireland. Uh, very crucially, the talks process itself was chaired by somebody from beyond their shores, the legendary George Mitchell, um, aided by uh, friends from Canada and Finland, uh, General John de Chastelain, and Pr uh, Prime Minister Harry Holkery, uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Harry Holkery, with invaluable input from the European Union, uh, and most particularly our good friends, the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, uh, the talks gained momentum in the spring of 1998, uh, building to a climax in early April. <coughs> I should say the talks went on nonstop from September 97 right through. So again, uh, I'm jumping through. The talks were effectively five days a week. Tony Blair and myself feeding in and out uh, and spending most of our weekends uh, on it because we had to deal with our other issues throughout the week. The aim of the talks, and I think... This is what's important to your attendees, just how we handle this. It was a comprehensive agreement which addressed a range of issues at the heart of the conflict and to which the British and Irish governments and the main political parties in Northern Ireland could sign up to. It was a hugely tall order given the lessons of history, and it certainly had not been achieved before. So we took the view that everything should be included, that we shouldn't just take out the easy bits or the hard bits or the middle bits, it was comprehensive. Uh, with good American pragmatism, George Mitchell set a deadline of Thursday the 9th of April uh, for the talks of 98. Um, the talks took place in, in Belfast, in, Cape, in, Cape, in um, Castle Buildings in Belfast. Um, that's in Stormont, where the Stormont house sits. Uh, the prospects for success as late as the beginning of that week were anything but encouraging. An opinion poll in a Belfast uh, newspaper published that weekend gave our chances of success 5%. So talking about no pressure, 
Um, <coughs> but maybe that was good because people didn't think you were going to get anywhere. Looking back, um, uh, that year was the most intensive of, of my life. I've been involved in lots of negotiations, but literally when you're dealing with life and death, knowing that if we failed, uh, conflict would start again. Uh, we put literally hundreds of hours uh, into the negotiations, working with, with Tony Blair face to face with the, all the parties, phone calls, consultation with British government, my own government, um, trying to find an elusive um, finishing line. Uh, of course, many times it looked as if we were going to fail, uh, that the talks would break down irretrievably as they had done before. We had crises, big, small, won't go into them. We would nervous people who had never met before, let it known, um, work together, now sitting at the same negotiating tables, um, trying to bring us to a brighter and a, a better future. Not surprisingly, tensions and tempers were regularly high. Uh, sadly, we also had violence continuing at times on the streets, a graphic reminder to us uh, that the stakes uh, were high and what was involved. Given the key position of the two governments as the sovereign powers involved and my role as head of one of those governments, uh, I was personally and deeply conscious of the responsibilities that lay on our shoulders, uh, but I was also seized by the opportunity that lay in our laps and, and the prize for success was enormous. So we just decided to give it and those working with us every effort. And I know that Tony Blair and his team did precisely the same. And then against the odds, again, moving on, um, and to the surprise, if not shock, of many, uh, we did achieve success in the late afternoon of Good Friday, the 10th of April, 1998. A day late, but thankfully, in this case, not a dollar short, agreement was uh, reached. And the day in what we hoped was a good omen happens to be the Good Friday, and also the eve of the Jewish Passover. Accordingly, the document um, came to be uh, called the Good Friday Agreement, uh, obviously signed in Belfast, so some people call the Belfast Agreement. Some weeks later, and very crucially, it was endorsed by the people. We had, for the first time since 1918, uh, a vote on the, on the one day of the entire island of Ireland, north and south. Both of them asked to ratify the agreement. I'm sure uh, the people are familiar with the terms. I gather it was part of some of the course, so... Uh, I'm not going to win it. There's no need to restate it. But in broad terms, uh, it constitutes the shared view of the British and Irish governments, the Northern Ireland parties, indeed the people of the island of Ireland as a whole, as to how relations were to be configured within Northern Ireland, between North and South, on the island of Ireland, and between Ireland and Britain. So three distinct uh, parts. Uh, their constitution provisions to give affected constitutional changes that were involved and they were huge because we were given up jurisdiction of the North. We were taking that out of our constitution, um, uh, essentially enshrining the principle of consent uh, of the people of Northern Ireland as a whole um, and to remain those who wanted to remain in the United Kingdom. Uh, it has institutional provisions, new partnership structures of government in Northern Ireland uh, to to capture cooperative arrangements between North and South uh, and between Ireland and Britain. It also had provisions uh, in regard to such diverse matters in Northern Ireland as policing, the administration of justice, victims of violence, economic, social, cultural issues, human rights, uh, decommissioning of arms, prisoners associated with the conflict, and very crucially, uh, as I mentioned, it had provision for agreement to be put to the people of North and South. So, and a whole lot of range of other issues, comprehensively. Uh, George Mitchell used to say that the implementation would be even more challenging in the negotiation. He was right. Um, I spent 10 years of my life, uh, luckily, and both Tony Blair and I were in power, and we continued up to 2007 uh, to implement agreement with all of the ups and downs over that period, the institutions agreement were suspended several times. Uh, there uh, was more stop than go at times, uh, just in case people think negotiations are easy. It's when you, you sign, then you have to implement. Uh, and that can be very, very difficult as I've learned in other conflicts since. Um, 
the most difficult issues, and they're the only ones I want to mention, were the decommissioning of IRA arms uh, and the transition to a new civilian uh, police force with genuine cross-community uh, support. Uh, we absolutely revamped the entire police force. Uh, as well as technically complex, these were profoundly emotive questions that to do with how the two communities of Northern Ireland interpreted the events of the previous generation or two and with attitudes to the legitimacy of power of state. Negotiations were torturous, they were complicated, seemingly endless. Uh, it also seemed that we, when we had solved the problems on one side, we created problems on the other, which is uh, usual in negotiations. An underlying difficulty remained that the majority unionist community remained profoundly divided over the very fundamentals of the agreement. Uh, finding the ups and downs and negotiations requiring enormous patience, stamina. I'm glad I was younger in those days, uh, and so was Tony Blair. Uh, we persevered, but um, again, jumping all the time. But I'm delighted that, aided by uh, important understandings achieved in the related uh, St. Andrew's Agreement in the autumn of 2006, we had a review clause in the agreement. So when it required reviews or to bring more parties on side, uh, we could do that. So we did that in autumn of 2006, and we were able to achieve the necessary conditions for then the full implementation of the agreement with all the parties on side. So uh, I think as, as we talk now, Northern Ireland is at peace. We have representatives of the two major traditions in Northern Ireland working constructively. They worked through the COVID crisis, the economic issues, um, they work in partnership in an executive. We have new projects of cooperation between North and South. Uh, we have the working on the creation of an all-island economy when it's necessary to deal with issues. Um, and we have unprecedented cooperation between the Irish government and the British government and the various devolved administrations of the British Irish Council. So I think all these things have worked well. Uh, the blocked energy that has been released by the new positive dispensation is wonderful to observe. Instead of people fighting and in conflict, they're dealing with the everyday issues, dealing with COVID-19, dealing with infrastructure, dealing with education and health. Um, and th these are all of the issues that uh, Northern Ireland now has given them global pr um, prominence. And in the Brexit discussions, uh, they have um, been probably part of the torture as they have got more time I think on the Brexit discussions than anywhere else uh, in the United Kingdom uh, and that's worked well. Um, we, we've moved to Dr Paisley and Mark McGuinness who were the two leaders on, the, on opposite sides but worked together very well in the executive have gone to their turn of reward. Peter Robinson took over he's now retired but did a fine job. Arlene Foster and uh, Michelle O'Neill are the two people now that are dealing with Arlene Foster for the uh, unionist side, uh, Michelle O'Neill for the national side. So it seems uh, that there is an opportunity, responsibility uh, on all of us who've been involved in what is one of the rare uh, successful peace processes to uh, try to share our experiences as I'm doing today and as we've done in, in many countries. We have had probably all of the conflict zones in the world, um, I think bar none, that have come to Northern Ireland over the last you know, 15 years or so, um, to ex study things we did right, things we did wrong, things that we should have done better. Uh, and, but it, is, it has been a help to them uh, and we've had everybody, and I've been involved in many of those from you know, last year, as I said, in Colombia. But we've had, we've had all of the, uh, we've had all of the, the groups from all of the other uh, countries. We got a lot of help, so we feel we should give that back. Nelson Mandela and um, Cyril Ramaphosa, the, the present leader, he was involved at the time with us in uh, Matti Atasari. They were our officers who looked at the arms uh, and, and put the arms beyond, um, beyond uh, the control of, of people who were involved in, uh, in, in, in armed struggle. So we owe it to people to be back. Uh, I suppose I just want to mention a few things that I think are important in summary and things that I have found that are relevant in all peace processes. Um, I should say at the start that uh, no two conflict situations are the same. 
each has its own unique character and its own unique features. Uh, I do believe, however, that there are some elements of our situation in Ireland uh, which might be drawn on in developing conflict resolution process elsewhere. And I just want to focus on a few of those. Firstly, I believe there has to be a broad acceptance by the parties involved in the conflict that the status quo is untenable, uh, that some form of agreement is better in terms of everybody's interests. Um, a key lesson is the need to be as inclusive and as I've been emphasizing, as comprehensive as possible in terms of the parties to negotiations. I do accept that it is sensitive issue in terms of um, who sovereign governments sit down and negotiate with it. But there cannot be a sense that is, is it possible to bomb one's way to negotiating table. No sovereign governments can allow that. And certainly in our case, we insisted that no party currently involved in violence directly or indirectly could be part of the process. Uh, so our inclusivity was not unconditional. Uh, and this was not just a basic moral principle, but also a matter of practical politics in terms of the participation uh, of others. Yet, on the other hand, uh, if those who are involved in the conflict are not party to the negotiations, uh, they will not feel themselves um, bound by the, the outcome. And I always used to think that, as Yitzhak Rabin said, you make peace with your enemies, not your friends. And in our case, Tony Blair and I opted for an inclusive approach uh, that had the majority of parties, including those associated with paramilitary groups around the tables. It was complex, it was difficult, in our context and situation, it proved ultimately the right decision. Uh, I feel it's a key decision, but uh, one can only be taken by those closely involved in terms of uh, each uh, negotiation uh, situation. Uh, a further lesson uh, that I've mentioned is comprehensiveness in terms of issues incorporated into negotiations. Again, this is complex. A small amount of issues is easier to handle uh, but dealing with as many as, as issues as possible. Uh, and it has to be left to each party to decide what is important to them. And it's crucial uh, to the likelihood of agreement sticking. I personally believe you're better off to have a comprehensive include every issue because other things come back to cause your problems ultimately if you don't. A further key requirement, and this is a personal one, is to seek to put yourself in the shoes of the other person with negotiations. Um, it's no good being a bull in a china shop. Um, I've watched poor negotiators, but you have to try and uh, be an even-handed negotiation. If you want to come in and lecture, um, you won't get an agreement. <laughs> you can might as well be talking to yourself in the mirror because you'll never solve nothing. Um, for the most part, parties involved in conflict do not know each other well. Um, in our case, they haven't even spoken to each other. They knew of each other, but never dealt with each other. And that means that at the outset, there is a lack of knowledge about where the other side is and where they're coming from. And in our case, for instance, Irish governments over the decades had very little contact with unionist politicians in the North. Uh, so I found myself having to deal with the Ulster unionist leader, David Trimble. I was meeting a man I didn't know. And it was important that I tried to put myself in his position, understand his problems and get an understanding in real terms uh, where of what he needed to achieve and over time I got to be really good friends with David Trimble and, and very much appreciated his, his work. In other words, if I can summarize it, it is important that participants in negotiations treat each other as human beings. Uh, that may sound simplistic but it's profoundly important in my view. That's how some degree of trust is built and if you don't have trust um, or a modicum of it at least, uh, success is impossible. And it's as simple as that. The involvement of external players is a key question. I've mentioned all the people that were involved in our case. Of course, we were lucky that we also had um, uh, President Clinton, both Tony Blair and I got on well with him. Uh, he took the issue seriously. Um, and George Mitchell, who was a, a great negotiator, uh, he had wisdom, he had humor, he had patience, he had tact, he had decisiveness, uh, and they were all indispensable to us. Uh, so looking back, um, I can see that outside players uh, bring a lot of energy um, to those directly involved. Um, and they brought a, a slightly distant perspective. And of course, you could say uh, things to all sides that 
uh, they couldn't say to each other. Um, the fact that we were lecturing each other for 800 years, um, everything was sensitive. Uh, so you had to get somebody uh, who could tell you, stop being a stupid idiot and get on with it. And then um, you need somebody uh, outside. And then they could equally say, we don't understand all this stuff anyway. But if you know what I mean, it's very important in negotiations. If you try to do that yourself, um, normally you get a bloody nose. Um, anyway, uh, you know the point. Uh, there's another point in terms of external involvement. I think the reality of today's world is that everything and every issue uh, is in increasingly interconnected. Uh, I am a huge multilateralist, um, uh, unlike President Trump, and I, I believe in multilateralism it being hugely uh, important. I, I believe that um, we're at the moment, unfortunately, whereas Erdogan, where there's Putin, um, or whether it is, it, it, it is um, Xi Jinping, uh, we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, I, I, I think I just wish these guys would get together. They're doing none of us any good. Uh, I don't think they're doing themselves any good. But anyway, that's my, I'm sure plenty of people disagree with me. But I can collectively say uh, multilateralism is the right way for the world to go. Uh, of course, we're not going that way at the, at the moment, but maybe another day. Um, but things are interconnected. And um, I, I had the great uh, honor in, in my later political career. I was one of the few people that had to address both houses of parliament in London and the houses of the United States, the joint houses. And the reason I was given that, that was not because they thought I was a nice guy, but uh, it was the recognition that the creation of peace in Ireland had important implications beyond uh, Ireland. And so it's not just a question of external dimension. Um, and these issues have to travel. And I think in conflict, um, we, we have to be prepared to share and work together to try and learn the mistakes as we made, and we've made plenty of them, uh, and also the lessons. But you also have to try to leave history at home. Um, now, I, I love history, so I'm not saying forget history. We never forget history. Uh, but uh, if, if it's all about history, then it's very difficult. Uh, we, we have many centuries of history to draw on. And George Mitchell used to say, we have an inexhaustible locker, uh, he called Irish history. And he was right on that, I can tell you. Uh, but the difficulty is that one person's history is another person's triumph or grievance. And uh, in these sensitive situations, there is no one definition of the same historical event. If it was, negotiations would be easy, but that's not how the cookie crumbles, as we say in Ireland. Um, it doesn't much, much time and energies are wasted in debate. And of course, tensions and temperatures rise and conditions are not conducive to secure an agreement. And I'm not advocating that we set history aside. That isn't what I said, because some people always, you have to say it twice that they think you're saying, I'll come in here and let's forget about our history. That, that is not the thing. I have to understand their history, but we must be sensitive to it. And we have to seek uh, to rise beyond it in a wider interest. If we all come in and say, so this is what happened 100 years ago, 200 years, 300 years ago, people always killed each other, bombed each other, uh, and they never got on with each other. So then we keep on doing that. Where do we get? Um, we have to be able to stand up. And it's not easy. Not easy, I tell you. I to go around my country and get the referendum passed and you have to explain and you have to analyze and you have to you know cajole and convince people of why it's worth taking these risks and moving constitutional change and all of the rest and in reality president any agreement is ultimately going to require some cold-eyed pragmatism and practical common sense um, and it needs politicians who are brave enough to do that not people who just want to rally the crowd uh, and want to be naysayers. Um, I say that after a long, I had to fight this in my early years when I was younger, but you, you have, if you're not prepared to stand up and argue back and, and fight the cause, you, you, you will not change things. You will not bring peace. And what we were trying to do um, was not bring an agreement for the sake of it. I've done many agreements in Europe and agreements with, with social partners and employment and um, negotiations in um, I noticed Europe yesterday or the early hours this morning completed the seven year negotiations of the plan. I did three of those in my political career. So, you know, I've been through it. But the difference in when peace processes and peace negotiations, it's life and death. 
Because if you make a mistake, if you say the wrong thing, someone is killed tonight. And that, that's the difference. That's, what, that's the difference between peace processes and economic negotiations or union negotiations or negotiations in political parties. So peace processes around conflict um, are a very different thing. So you have to be you know, very, very cautious and careful at the same time, brave and, uh, and constructive. Um, so um, I suppose um, a, a particularly important lesson from our process in my view is the need to find a way to secure the valuation the validation of it. And as I said, we, we had that vote uh, for the whole island. Um, I think it was important to do that. It wasn't my idea, it was John Hume's idea, but it was a very good one. And a further lesson is to put in place structures and in institutions which will enable people to work together afterwards, after you've gone practical matters, people that they can find ways of dealing with economic development, education, healthcare. Uh, because they're the important the things. And in our situation, I think the new institutions established under the Good Friday Agreement have proved extremely valuable in that regard. I'm not saying not without problems again, but they prove valuable. Uh, so reflecting back, I would suggest that, you know, huge store be placed on the process of the implementation of any agreement. One thing negotiating, another thing signing, but implementing is important. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement constituted a critical moment in terms of closure uh, of the past for us in Ireland. But at another level, it was a beginning, and beginnings in any project in life can be fragile experiences. A key lesson in our process, therefore, is undoubtedly the, the need to think closely about how agreement is to be implemented and how it's carried uh, forward. And um, I, reflecting back, I, I think we, we learned lessons on it. We tried to share there, those lessons and uh, I, again, as I said at the start, it was a deep honor for me um, uh, to, and privilege uh, to have had the opportunity to make a contribution uh, to making a peace in my own country. Uh, something that will remain with me uh, from my days. It's, well, if I won abiding impression, it would be about the people, about the relationships uh, formed, about the relationships made, uh, and unquestionably, the making of peace was a, a vast team effort. Lots of people were involved in it, involving the contribution of people who put in a lot, a lot of hours, advisors and, and people who gave us a lot of information. And I suppose I, I, I want to end on a, a sadder note. Um, a, a, my abiding thought would be for the victims of the troubles. Uh, I spent um, literally days and days meeting the families uh, of British soldiers, uh, of police in the north, of um, people from the IRA background, uh, people from unionist backgrounds, uh, people who some people would consider terrorists, other people consider them freedom fighters, some people consider security forces, others continue occupation forces. It doesn't really matter. Um, they were all victims and I, I had to face them. Um, in most cases, um, widows, uh, but not always. Um, there were people uh, bombed. There were uh, females uh, who were died. Their children were killed, and um, females who were legal people who were trying to represent people that were blown to pieces because they were doing their job, trying to be legal representatives and following the order of law. Um, so uh, I always think that. Uh, for those that were named and injured, in our case, tens of thousands that were named and injured, uh, uh, I'll carry their concerns for the rest of their lives because they're the ones that have the scars, uh, whether physical or mental, of the terrible time of history. So my deepest hope is that it would be a consolation to all of them uh, that hopefully no family will have to go through in the future what they had to endure in the past. Thank you very much, President Dan. Uh, an honour to be with you and hope I didn't go too long. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there was applause in Zurich. Um, I think there was applause all over the world. Um, thank you very much for, for sharing your experiences. 
um, uh, with us th this evening. Uh, that was uh, it's and, and your last point is a poignant one, um, and and one which I think it's it's very important to remember, um, especially when we talk about these things in a sort of academic um, conference setting. Uh, we can we can forget sometimes the human factor, um, which is taking part. Um, I, I'm going to open up uh, to the Q and A now. So if people have a question, um, if they could um, uh, raise that, either write it in the chat, um, uh, and then I'll read it out, uh, or you can also raise your hand. Um, um, and I'll give you the um, and I'll give you the give you the floor. Um, so I think uh, a student of mine um, from the uh, American University of Kurdistan, so Nazar. I just sir, if I can. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, sir, thank you for your precious speech. You mentioned many points, but I have a question to ask your excellency. How to make a balance between respecting your history, respect, respecting your victims of black days, and being realistic for today, for making peace agreement? Because you have to, I mean, step down and go back for something, for example, because peace, his, uh, peace agreements, peace treaties are not easy. You may hand over many things, but I mean, anyways, you have to respect your grandfather, grandmothers, the one who tried hard for your land. So how to respect your histories as a side, as a side and other side being realistic for today? I don't know if you got my question, sir, or not. Yeah. Um... You know, I think you have to come uh, to a conclusion. Uh, are you happy to have the status quo um, in your country, in your land? Um, or do you want to see progress? Do you want to see um, a balanced, fair uh, settlement? Um, if you are happy with the status quo, um, and I'll, I'll give you the example of Ireland, but I've seen it many other places too. But if you're happy with the status quo that you get up every morning and the first item in the news is who was shot dead last night and the second item is where was blown up last night and the third item is what funerals are on today um, uh, or what protests are on. Well, then, if you're happy with that for your life, then uh, I, I, I suppose you know, you go back to bed um, and say, you know, that's, that's how it's going to be. Um, in, in our case, uh, from the time I was in school, in second level school, um, all the way through, uh, that was the news of the day. Uh, and when, when I was coming up through the ranks in politics, I, I continually advocated uh, that we we, we had to, and leaders be, that were there at my time, Charles Hawhey, Albert Reynolds, great people, um, who, who were, uh, you know, and Gareth Fitzgerald, John Bruton, who were the opposition, but equally great people. And all of these uh, wanted to try and stop the violence and get a fair and balanced settlement. And, you know, it, it's not easy to do. Uh, but if you can get somebody to negotiate, in our case, quite frankly, the reason it probably didn't happen earlier was we had great difficulty getting the British government to first accept that we had a, a role in Northern Ireland, um, though we constitutionally claimed it, uh, and to be prepared to treat us as one and to go to the negotiating table. Uh, so you, 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 but you have to fight for that. We spent many, many years fighting and articulating our case so that we could get to negotiate the table. Um, but if you take the position, my father uh, was um, an old IRA man in the 1920s, the War of Independence. But if I was to take the same view that my father thought that the armed struggle was the way to go on, um, I'm not sure he would have taken that view as he got older anyway, but 
uh, he was dead when I negotiated a Good Friday Agreement. <clears throat> I think he would have been maybe concerned about some issues. But you, 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 you have to move for a better future. Uh, and do you want your children, um, if, you're, if you're not worried about yourself, do you want your children or your neighbor's children to, to grow up having the same way as the past? And, and I think that's a hard question. That's a hard question, but you have to challenge yourself. Uh, do, you want your, do you want people to have a, a peaceful coexistence with the so-called enemy, with a balanced settlement, or, or are you just prepared for the killing and the mayhem to go on? And I think when you truthfully uh, answer that, uh, ask that question to nearly everybody, not everybody, but nearly everybody, um, the, the view is that you move on. I should have said, President, that when we had the vote in Ireland, in the south of Ireland, 94% of the people voted for the agreement. In Northern Ireland, three quarters of the people voted for the agreement. Overall, the island, over three quarters of the people. So the people ultimately, by a huge majority, decided they wanted to move on. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for the honor of having you here and sharing your valuable knowledge and experience with us. In the be beginning, you mentioned that you had been involved um, in the Kurdish developments in, in Turkey, and I would just like to ask for your take on it. Um, with reference to recent developments um, in the latest years, um, the HDP has been established in Turkey where it's not solely a Kurdish party, but they are more left wing and they do call for Kurdish and other minority rights. Um, but this has resulted in most of the representatives being imprisoned, um, called out in parliament and uh, basically the the political structure sort of demantling, not being accepted to talk about these issues. But then on the other hand, um, I resonate a lot with how you spoke about Ireland, where we also have this more military wing or this, um, the PKK essentially being called a terrorist group in the inter international community, but to most of Kurds being this idea of freedom fighting. Um, Turkey is now also infringing on Iraq's sovereignty and the Kurdistan regional government sovereignty by uh, the air raids that have taken place nowadays because of PKK's presence in the mountains. And my question is, how do you resolve a conflict where you are taking military measures, peace talks continue to fail because of ceasefires, um, dismantling and also cultural genocides going on. I mean, the city of Hassan Kif is historically a Kurdish city and is one of the most ancient towns in all of Mesopotamia and Anatolia, but has now been completely dis, uh, dismantled and created as uh, been transformed into a dam. So how, how do you go forth in uh, in these peace talks, how do you how do you resolve a conflict where the other side is dehumanized, the other side is ignored, um, in the political aspect, not and uh, labeled as terrorists on the political aspect, even though, um, say, economic uh, ties are created with the KRG, we still don't have this sort of sovereignty or this sort of um, um, power to really sit on a table, represent Kurds, um, whether that be the PKK or the HDP or the KRG, to sort of come to an agreement, where do we stand? Uh, because this is a, I mean, it's a regional conflict, but it's been ongoing, arguably, since the very establishment of Turkey as a republic. So how do you go forth in this, in your opinion? Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, it, it just should I say, I, I've been spending a good bit of time for the last uh, probably four or five years um, since before the 
uh, attempt at um, military coup um, with the Democratic Political Initiative, which is a um, NGO body that brings together uh, many of the uh, people from from Turkey. So I've been, I've been there a, a number of times, uh, and um, we have used the lockdown nearly on a every fortnightly basis to have uh, sessions. So I, I'm not saying I've been a big contributor, but I've been listening. We we we've had representatives from from all sides, from the political groupings, um, from universities. Um, from media people, from writers, uh, from academics. And um, last week we had one of, of um, women uh, from various groups about the role of women in the, uh, in the difficulties. <clears throat> I think to answer your question, and I don't purport to be an expert and more in on these sessions, listening and trying to find if there's a way we could get back. Uh, prior to uh, the attempted coup, uh, I thought we were making some valued progress and it seemed as if the administration uh, were uh, up to having substantive negotiations uh, and that died um, at that stage and, and has not been renewed. But there has been a, a lot of work uh, going on um, by, I'm sure, other organisations as well as DPI, but trying to see... Um, if at some stage, at the appropriate stage, they can try and uh, reinvigorate the, the peace process. But I think the answer to your question, in the present, in the present circumstances, there, there isn't much hope. Uh, because if the administration, a, a bit like in the Irish case, uh, when the British government refused to recognise our role as the Republic of Ireland, or refused to uh, treat us as an equal partner to engage with us, um, there was, or, or, or having people that were prepared uh, to take that leadership role. Um, it, we weren't able to make much progress. It was only when we got those, those circumstances where we were. And I think that's, that's the, that is the, 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 the answer to, to your question. But, and I think you explained it, it well in the historical position. Can I say, but uh, there, are, there are a lot of us um, uh, who have been trying uh, to to be of assistance, and I don't want to mention the names because I haven't got the uh, authority to mention names. But ma many people that would would be known that have been involved in peace and conflict resolution, who've been giving their time and efforts to see if they can re-establish a basis. And DPI have published. I, I'm sure nothing that you're not aware, of, but DPI have pro published probably ten publications in the last maybe six months. Uh, a very good analysis of uh, and documenting where we, we should go. So all I can tell you from my part, I'll continue to try to, uh, to help and to, uh, to, be, to be supportive. But um, there, in the last three years, um, uh, there's been very, 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 very little progress, but there, there's been a lot of engagement by people trying to, to find a basis and ready to move when they think the circumstances are right. And I, for one, continue to do that. Um, perfect. So I'm aware that we're we're sort of going past our allotted time. Is, are you are you okay to take a couple more questions? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so Clement, uh, Clement will ask a question. Um, as my other colleagues, I would like to thank you for sharing your experience and great great insight about um, peace negotiation and resolution. And the question I had concerned the current Brexit situation in the UK. And uh, according to your view, how would Brexit, would Brexit impact the Belfast Agreement? And what kind of solution do you think uh, the, the current government could find to try to avoid to break this Belfast Agreement, uh, especially on questions such as borders or economic uh, issue uh, with funding by the European Union? Uh, and when you are actually also dealing with um, trying to find a peace negotiation or agreements, how do you think about this sustainability in uh, agreements? So yes, if you have your, if you could answer this question, yeah, thank you. That would be great. Yes, um, 
you know, needless to say, in, in Ireland, there, there was almost, for once in our lives, there was almost a unanimous view. Um, we were opposed to Brexit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not often that we, uh, we all shared the same stage, but uh, on Brexit, we did. And um, listen, we, we have to get on with it now. Uh, we did get uh, a protocol. What, what we, the, the one thing we cannot uh, do is have any kind of a border. Uh, we, we, we spent 100 years trying to remove a border. Uh, so I think we, it, it, in the agreement, uh, the withdrawal agreement, finally, I think we, uh, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, uh, agreed uh, to an arrangement where we won't have a, have a, have a, a border in, on the island of Ireland. Uh, that creates some problems um, in Northern Ireland, but I think that's surmountable. Um, I, I think, uh, by the way, it was a long, hard and difficult fight, but if, 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 if the agreement stays where it is, um, and if, if Prime Minister Johnson doesn't change it in the, as we move to the inclusion of the, uh, the trade agreement over the next few months, I think we can, we can live with it. Um, the, the, the difficulty <clears throat> is, I, I'm positive about this in one way, uh, Northern Ireland now, as, as, as the protocol um, is written, Northern Ireland will be still part of the United Kingdom, uh, but also for a huge amount of areas, they will be still working with the, the European Union. So uh, if that stays as is, I think there's a, there's a good opportunity uh, for Northern Ireland uh, to, be, to be able to um, use their position uh, to the advantage of EU uh, trade, EU business, and also the UK business. And um, I think if, if, they, if there are good opportunities, which they didn't see a year ago, but I think they do see now. And I think if, 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 if Boris um, leaves things as they are, uh, and if he just keeps himself busy with other things, um, then, then, then we, we will be able to manage this fairly, um, fairly su successfully. But the one thing where we cannot do, we can't have uh, a regulatory border on the island of Ireland. Um, uh, I, I, your audience know Ireland, but it's a long, long border of uh, hundreds of kilometres. Uh, it wouldn't work. It would be a source of conflict and division, hopefully not violence, but um, uh, would create major difficulties. So I think finally we've negotiated a, a position uh, that, can, that is sustainable. Um, and your question just overall on, on agreements, I think it's very important that agreements when they're negotiated. And this is why it's better when it's comprehensive, because the better the understanding, the clearer understanding, the more clarity um, in negotiations, um, the less difficulties in implementation. It's where people try to go back and say, no, we didn't really mean that. Um, that's not workable. I think it, it, an agreement is an agreement. And that's why I hope um, I'll take the prime minister on, on, on his word that the withdrawal agreement and the uh, protocol for Northern Ireland has been agreed and will not be reopened. And if that's the case, we, it's not ideal, um, but it, it's manageable. Um, I also want to thank you for sharing your experience and time. Um, I have, like, given your involvement in these in very different contexts from Bougainville to Ukraine to Turkey, um, in, in your view, what, how would you describe or, yeah, how would you describe the regional differences in these kinds of negotiations and how much weight would you give in for these uh, differences. So is it completely different to negotiate in, in Asia than it is in, in Eastern Europe? Or do, what did you experience in that time? Um, as I said, no, no conflict, no two conflicts are the same. Um, uh, but, you know, personalities, partnership, dialogue, trying to build up trust, um, understanding, you know, good manners, uh, all of those things I think are, 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 are similar. Um, 
Uh, what's different is in negotiations, and I don't want to mention any names, but what's different is it's always good when you're in negotiations to know who you're negotiating with um, and that there's not somebody in the background who, who you never have an opportunity of negotiating with uh, who really is the person who you should be negotiating with. Um, that, that's the difficulty in, in, in a lot of conflicts um, uh, because if there is... If there is somebody there that uh, has their own agenda, um, sometimes even if they're challenged, they deny that they're, they're involved, um, um, then it, it makes life very, very difficult. Uh, in, my, in my view, it doesn't matter how difficult a person is if they're there with you and you're negotiating with them. Um, it doesn't matter how tough they are or how they are or you know, uncompromising they are. If, if they're at the negotiating table, or you're involved in dialogue with them. I mean, I have, I have negotiated with um, paramilitary groups, um, obviously through their political leaders. Um, uh, I've done that in Ireland. I, 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 I've, I've done that in, in, in um, Papua New Guinea. Um, you know, people that were involved in horrendous conflicts on my own island and, 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 and there. Um, and you, you've, you've dealt with, I, I mean, I've, I've traveled extensively in Ukraine, uh, but it, it, it's, it's when, you, when you can't negotiate, this is the frustrating part where, where the, the agents are, are, are somebody else that are um, really pulling the strings. And that's what makes, and that's why we have conflicts, quite frankly. Uh, sometimes in the world, in my view, I just give my view, uh, we've probably 20 major conflicts in the world at the moment. Ireland is just won a seat in the Security Council. Um, we only stand for about every decade and a half or so. Thankfully, we, 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 we were, were back there again. Last time we were there was Afghanistan was the big, the big issue. Um, uh, but it, it, you see in these conflicts that um, when, when you have, have people who who are really have vested interests and don't really want settlements and have some regional reason for keeping a conflict going. Um, it's very, very hard to make any progress uh, where you can deal with the people head on, face up, no um, matter how tough they are, it's, it's, it's possible to make progress. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is, Looking back at the negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement, what would you say were the biggest missteps that happened or the biggest pitfalls that the negotiation fell into that you would say that that's one of the mistakes that you now always talk about or tell other negotiators in similar situations to avoid? Yeah, I think the, 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 the one that caused us horrendous problems and difficulties and delays was the, the question of how to deal with the arms, uh, putting arms beyond use. Uh, and taking arms out of the equation. Um, it's, it's, it's not unusual in, in, in conflicts. In, in a lot of the groups that have come to Ireland that, that, that I've gone to meet in other countries, it's the same as well. What, what we did in 1998 when we were negotiating the agreement, we said that we would set up um, an international com commission of decommissioning and we'd bring international figures um, and that we'd legislate both in Westminster and in, in, in Ireland um, to deal with the issue. Um, but, you know, and that's what we, that's what we did. But when, when we went to try to, 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 to get the sides to agree uh, on putting the arms beyond use and putting all the arms beyond use, um, we, we met every barrier. So it, 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 if we had been far more prescriptive about the issue, um, I think we, we probably spent from the end of 1998 till about 2006 to resolve that issue. Uh, where in other areas, uh, so that was one, if I was doing it again, I would have been very, very clear. Um, and of course, it wouldn't have been easy anyway, but we, we could have made it far easier on ourselves and then everyone else. And it actually caused a lot of problems to some of the politicians who signed the Good Friday Agreement because then they were accused that they weren't delivered what they had told people to agree for. So that was a really, really difficult uh, issue. Um, and give you the other side of that, when it came to policing, um, 
we set out very clearly what we would do and, and, and more or less how we would do it. And then Chris Patton, who was in the former Tory minister, who is now in the news because he was the negotiator of the Hong Kong deal uh, back in the mid 90s, <clears throat> up to 97 when, when, when the UK left um, uh, left Hong Kong. Um, uh, we, we had set out the ground rules for him and uh, he, he, he comprehensively um, changed a police force that had been there since the 20s, um, renamed it, rebranded it, re-legislated, restructured it, reformed it, changed it from being a predominantly um, Protestant unionist police force into being almost 50-50. In a short few years, um, I still try to work out how, how, how we actually did it. But um, uh, so he, he, here was a guy who we had given the ground rules well, and then he was able to do it. So I just give you the two examples. Um, I wouldn't change the policing one, but I sure would change the, uh, the decommissioning one. So also from my side, many thanks for your speech and your time. Um, my question is not regarding a specific context or conflict, but um, maybe rather a meta frame. You mentioned that while creating solution options, sometimes also new problems are created. And I would be interested how to go on from that point then. Yeah, um, I, I, I think in um, uh, when you're dealing with conflict situations and uh, as I said earlier on, the more comprehensive you are, the, the, the better. But I, I, I do think you have to try to look um, look out to the future and see how this will work in practice. Um, how these people who don't particularly like each other, um, who, well, I should say, certainly don't like each other, who distrust each other, um, uh, how, how you, can, you can make a, a system uh, that um, when, when you finish the negotiations or maybe it's voted through, uh, that they can actually work. And I think it's important to put a lot of thought and, and effort into that. Um, I wouldn't say we got that 100% right or maybe anything near it. So, uh, but I do think in, in the areas, like if I, if I just quickly go back on the Irish situation, what we did see well, there were three distinct sets of negotiations, three distinct solutions after we were left. There was how it would work within Northern Ireland. That was the parties within in Northern Ireland, how they were going to be able to cooperate and work together and share power um, and how they would be able to work as a collective. Uh, that was one set. Totally separate was how the representatives from the North would deal with the Republic of Ireland government and how that would work out, and spelling out how that would array, how they would meet, what they would talk about, how they would deal with. And then the third one was how the British government and the Irish government as two sovereign governments would deal with it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we sometimes, uh, by spelling out the rules and spelling out how they should meet, what they should meet, how the agenda should be, how it should be formulated, the more detail you put, um, the easier it is to work. Now, I, I again quickly saying we didn't get that perfect and there are still things that I think could work better. But uh, if we just had have said um, there are three distinct sets of relationships here and they sh people should be elected to them and, you know, that's it, case or um, But I think you have to take um, each, e each time you, you, you negotiate a block and say, this is the agreement, then you have to think, well, okay, that's great. That sounds great. How, how does this work in practice for the next X number of years? You know, uh, who, who, who chairs this? How do they share power? Who has authority to do what? And in a divided society, um, these things have to be taught through. Now, we did do that. Did we get it all right? No. But I think we did set a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the detail. And I think the more detail you do, um, but in, in negotiations, I should say, Everyone doesn't have to be doing everything together. I think it's good. It's good to have some subgroups who go off and look at things, maybe non-contentious things, or <clears throat> look at things that, you know, the, the operational systems and 
try and you know simultaneously keep things going together. We we did that, and then um, funny enough, some of the subgroups did maybe better work than we did. Um, you know, because they were they had a brief and a mandate, and they they went off and did things very well. But I think that's what you need to do is the is the is the nitty gritty detail, um, document it, set it out, think it out, plan it out. H how is this going to work in practice uh, and in 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 the distant future? Uh, and that's very important in in, in negotiating. If you're to leave if you're to leave the job, well done. Hi, um, I have uh, a question. So when uh, end peace processes, um, how do you create um, an agreement that promotes positive peace and reconciliation versus just stopping the conflict itself? And then co like connected to that, how do you deal with issues of transitional justice and war crimes, especially since some of the people sitting at the table will likely be war criminals themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very, very good question. Um, I, I think the, uh, the the first thing is that uh, having a, an agreement that just stops the, the violence. Um, I'm not saying it, you can create the circumstances of a ceasefire, but if you just try and create a ceasefire and say, now we have an agreement, um, it, it, it's, it's no use. Um, that happened in, in, in Ireland, but it's happened nearly everywhere. You get a ceasefire, and then somebody doesn't do what they thought they were going to do, or there's a misunderstanding about what was meant to happen, and then it breaks down. That's when I made reference to the ceasefire in Ireland. And um, on, on the justice, what we did in Northern Ireland is um, we set up an, almost an entire new system. Not alone was there a new police force, but there was a new criminal justice system. Uh, uh, there was a practically all the equality legislation, uh, all of the legislation on, you know, uh, how life is to work legislatively uh, was changed, how things are going to be inquired into, um, anonymous person for this and for that. So all of those things were built into the system because if, if, if they were not going to do it, then you were, you were just carrying the old practices forward again. And um, in fairness to the British government, I think they did a good job by us um, enacting uh, careful legislation uh, that rewrote uh, most of the, the legislation that was seen to be, you know, authoritarian um, or legislation that seemed to, to be unfair and unreasonable, mainly to the Catholic population who, who even those who were no respect for violence or no time for violence, were, were very against the, the kind of laws. So um, the amount of legislation, I didn't want to go into too much detail. In my, in, it was, I was long enough without going through. But if I was to list all the legislation that went through between 19, 1998 and 2004, it was immense. And it was that whole judicial uh, legislation uh, of equality uh, and parity of esteem, which was the key issue that, um, that people were seeing that there was a new justice system that gave parity of esteem uh, to both unionists um, uh, and to, and to, uh, to, to, to nationalists. Um, what was the last, you, 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 there was a third part of your question that was important. Um, can you, can, can you present, just remind me what they, the last part of that speak? Um, I think you covered most of it, but it was more about exactly how do you deal with issues of war crimes when the people oh, yes. at the table are war, may be war criminals themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what we, we did in, in Northern Ireland was, um, we agreed to allow out on licenses all the prisoners that had been uh, prisoners of the Troubles within the two year period. They were allowed out on license on the basis that if they, if they, were, if they continued on being engaged in, in, in violence, criminality, that they, they were back into prison to, for, their, for their new offence and for whatever outstanding sentences that they that they had, um, but for people that were outside, people that were never caught, um, 
if 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 they were caught and uh, for murder or for something, uh, they could be brought back in and 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 tried. But most of them would get would would get out on the two year limit. Um. So by and large, they most of them only served two years. So people who did fairly horrendous crimes, um, all crimes are horrendous, but you know what I mean. Um, got out on 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 the two year rule. Um, now. Uh, there, there are still the the prisoners. I should say the prisoners that got out. I always worry that that could be a major problem. That wasn't the major problem. Very few of them broke the license agreement. Um, but what continued to be was people that were never caught for various offences. And you know how how are they dealt with? Um, and you know while while they can be in they can be tried and they win but they would probably get out again fairly quickly. We, we, I tried to follow the South African model. Um, I spent a long time um, talking to um, F.W. de Klerk and Cyril Ramaphosa about the truth and justice system in South Africa. Um, and you know what they did with it? They, 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 they had this truth commission where you went before it and you gave it. The, um, there was no takers for that at the time in Northern Ireland. As time goes on, I think to finalize some of the cases where people just want to know what happened. They're not interested in people being jailed, but they want to know, you know what happened to their loved ones. Um, some people think that some kind of a scheme like that uh, goes on. But we, there are a, a number of cases where we have the, which we call the legacies of the troubles that continue, can still continue on where mm -hmm. people were not prosecuted and where people don't know the full facts uh, and some of those cases are still there. Um, the longer you keep those there, it, it does cause problems. But uh, under the law, you know, they're still entitled to be heard in, 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 in courts. OK, wonderful. Thank you very much. We've gone well over um, the allotted time, but uh, the, uh, I think the questions, yeah, it was, it was fascinating to get your insights into those. Um, I can only reiterate um, the thanks which we've, which we, uh, which our questioners have already expressed. Usually now we would hand you a big, a big box of Swiss chocolate, um, and say, yeah, and as a as a thank you for coming. Uh, I don't think there's a virtual equivalent um, to that, or not one that I know of yet. Um, so, yeah, from from our side, thank you very much for taking the time um, for sharing your insights. It's it's really been an honour. Um, and it's a shame you won't be here with us in person, but I'll keep the box safely for you um, when you, hopefully you will be able to come to Zurich. Yeah, well, look forward, President uh, Jack, to, um, uh, to, to, to coming to see your university, meet, meet your colleagues. Um, an honor to talk to all your participants and um, I hope that their, their, their days in your conference go well. And um, it's been a, a pleasure for me to participate in your, your seventh um, conference and I wish you negotiations is uh, is, a, is, a, is a huge uh, issue. There's negotiations in, in every part of life and um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an important part of life. So I wish all the people who are involved in it and particularly young people who will be involved in it into the future, wish them, wish them well in it. It's a, it is satisfying when you get to a conclusion, uh, frustrating when you don't, but uh, I wish them well and wish you all well and it's an honor to be with you and I'll be back for the chocolate someday. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I give. Take care. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so for the uh, participants, um, uh, that brings us to the end of the first day. Uh, I hope that you've, uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you for engaging so positively. Um, we're going to be continuing tomorrow at 1.30 Central European Summer Time. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, those of you who haven't done your videos yet, 